Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur. Today I'm joined by Dr. Ethan Weiss. And I've got to be honest, this is an interview I've been looking forward to because as a preventive cardiologist, I can't help it. I like talking to other preventive cardiologists, especially when they're low carb friendly preventive cardiologists. Because let's be honest, we're kind of a rare breed. But before we get into all the details, first, Dr. Weiss, he has got his medical degree and internal medicine residency from Johns Hopkins. He did his cardiology fellowship at UCSF, where he is now on staff, um, both in a clinical role and in a research role. And I think that's something that's that makes him um, uniquely positioned to give great advice and think about things from a wonderful perspective because he has that one-on-one -on -one interaction with patients. What can I do to help this patient in front of me today and now with what I know? And he has an understanding of what it takes to design these trials and run trials and, and do good science. And that's a big part of his message is sort of doing good science means separating the emotion from science. And we, and we talk about that. We also talk about the article he wrote with Nicola Guess about low carb tribalism and sort of he has some interesting perspectives about reflecting on how he wrote that and sort of the reception he got and how he would do things differently. I think that's very interesting. And as you'll notice, as we start discussing things, this thread or this this topic of LDL, of course, comes up multiple times. I tried to drag it out and, and save it for the end um, to get through a lot of the stuff first before we opened up what can be a can of worms. Let's face it, LDL can be um, very controversial, but I, I do appreciate his pro his approach to it. Um, and even though everybody listening isn't going to agree with his approach or agree with his conclusions, I hope you can you can recognize his thought process and why, you know, what he goes through to reach his conclusions and why he believes what he believes. And I, I think it's a lesson we can all learn. Again, trying to separate emotion from science. I think that's sort of the the take home message here. So I enjoy this. You can probably tell just by my enthusiasm of talking about it now. I hope you enjoy it just as well. Dr. Ethan Weiss, welcome to the Diet Doctor Podcast. It's great to have you today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I've been, look, I've been looking forward to this for a while. I mean, you're, in my mind, you're one of the most sane and logical voices in preventive cardiology. And I almost made you choke on your water there. Sorry about the, the timing of that comment. Caught you off guard. But, but I guess the sad thing is when it comes to nutrition, when it comes to um, medications, when it comes to trying to to combine the worlds of healthcare and nutrition, there are a lot of voices out there on the extremes, and it's it's sort of rare to find educated voices in the middle. I guess that's sort of how I see you, but we'll we'll see in this discussion if that's true or not. Is that is that how you see yourself? Uh, well, I mean, I do probably have an uh, affinity for trying to be relatively uh, moderate. I like I like to please everybody, so there's that. But but I yeah, I think. Um, I hope just to keep an open mind. I think I've tried very hard to keep an open mind with, uh, with, with all this stuff, you know, throughout my career. So maybe that's, yeah. yeah. Do you think that's a rarity in, in what you've seen from, you know, colleagues from Twitter, from the way you were trained? Do you think it's, it's rare for a doctor in your position to really say, I'm keeping an open mind and I want to be objective about this and admit what I don't know and, explore things for their own merits? It's hard to quantify how rare it is. I think that people, um, unfortunately, um, and, and look, it's hard, right? We're, we're, we've been taught for the past 20 plus years to be evidence-based and I aspire to be as evidence-based as possible. The problem is that there's a whole world of, of stuff out there for which there really is no evidence basis. And so then do we just ignore it? Um, uh, you know, that sort of question for me has always been, how do we incorporate some of these areas for which we don't have data yet, or the data or quality is pretty poor, how do we incorporate that? Uh, and what do you do for the people, you know, their clinical situations where I think they're really important questions that are not answered and may never be answered. And we, we may touch on some of those later, but I, I just, I think we're doing our patients a disservice to just throw up our hands and say, there's well, there, there are no data, so we're just not able to to even weigh in, I think. Yeah, I think that's such an important point. I think we're gonna we're gonna get into some some details about that for sure. But you are a preventive cardiologist with your own practice, practicing at UCSF. You are an educator, teaching fellows and working in the hospital and the in the CCU. And you're a researcher, actually working on re designing and working on research projects and publishing papers. So you sort of are a combination of, of three different versions of, of a healthcare provider and a scientist. 
Um, and I think that probably gives you a more unique perspective than many in terms of the, like you said, the quality of the science and where the evidence exists and where it doesn't. So from that perspective, since you've seen, you know, drug trials, you you prescribe medications, you take care of patients, what do you think the state of nutritional research is, the, the quality of nutritional research as it applies to um, helping that patient in front of you, having an intervention to help one person in front of you? Is it strong? Is it weak? Is it absent? Like, how would you kind of qualify that? Well, I don't think it's absent. I think it's, uh, it's not the strongest in the world. Uh, you know, I think it's, if you want to sort of identify what is the gold standard level of evidence that we all would sort of aspire to want to have to make a clinical decision, it would be something, you know, like a randomized controlled trial. And there are scant few of those in the nutrition world, especially when you start to look at outcomes that are so-called hard outcomes, like, you know, heart attack risk or stroke or, uh, or death. I mean, you know, there, there's really a small number. And partly I think that's because there hasn't been sort of the financial incentive to, to pay for such studies. There are hard to do. It's very hard to untangle the specific nutrition intervention from the real world prescription. Uh, and there are, you know, multiple other obstacles to doing, you know, well done sort of robust and rigorous clinical trials that, in nutrition. It doesn't mean they can't be done. And I think they can and, uh, and will be done. It's just they, you know, we're sort of lagging there. I think a lot of the, the evidence basis in nutrition these days is, is derived from epidemiology and small, you know, sort of unrandomized and uncontrolled studies. And, and obviously the quality of that is, well, it's harder to, to make much of that. But clearly you've made some sort of a break from what we could say is the standard dogma of preventive cardiology teaching. Cause the, you know, I was trained in an Ornish style program and it's the, the low fat, plant-based diet is what is promoted most often with plenty of grains uh, by the AHA, by um, most preventive cardiology societies. But you've taken a, you've sort of broken from that and gone more towards the higher fat, um, lower carb version. So give us a little bit of your background on how you got led down this path and, and, and why, and, and if it was difficult to do that break from what you've been taught for so long. Yeah, for me, it's even... Um more complicated because not only have I sort of died, grew up in the era of the sort of low fat Ornish style cardiology world, but, but I, my dad is also a cardiologist. So I grew up, literally grew up in the home of somebody who bought into that, you know, the 1970s and 80s. And, and I, I always tell people that we didn't, we didn't just have low fat in the home. We had no fat in the home. We had, we had egg beaters and margarine. I mean, everything you can think of that sort of today makes people cringe. But we had basically replaced an entire macronutrient category, and what we replaced it with, of course, was was carbohydrates. So I, I could have, you know, I, I could have almost anything I want as long as it didn't didn't have a lot of fat in it. So we were uh, this sort of that's how I grew up. Now, how did that change? Uh, well, for one, I think uh, you know I probably just became a little bit more curious. But but really, where it changed was. Was I was introduced to the folks at Verda Health, and uh, ultimately was asked to join their advisory board, uh, and I served on that for for three years. And when I did that, I, I you know sort of came in pretty skeptical. I did a lot of reading, um, got to know the data as best I could, and started to think, well, gosh, this story is definitely more complicated. Uh, and mm -hmm. and that was sort of the beginning of the journey for me. And that was probably four years ago, five years ago. That's so interesting. I, I assume they brought you in specifically to, to be the skeptic that you weren't low carb and they wanted you to be the skeptic, but then you, you turned into not to be the skeptic after all, you turned in, out to be the believer in the end. I don't know why they brought me in, but I do give them credit for bringing me in as somebody who was not a true believer. And, and again, I don't, uh, I, I think I cringe at the concept of being ever called a true believer in anything. I mean, I really don't, that is one thing I would uh, aspire never to do is to just be become overly religious or dogmatic about anything. I, I try to follow the data and follow the science the best I can. And that's what I did with, you know, with that experience with Verda was I was looking, you know, both at their data and historical data and seeing that this picture that had been painted was not necessarily as it was, which happens a lot in medicine. But can, I, I, what do you think about people who, who have yet to sort of recognize that? And in fact, 
so stoutly believe the opposite, that no, fat is still bad, um, carbs are still good, the whole grains are still necessary, um, and saying otherwise is crazy. I mean, the term keto is, is almost like a bad word among cardiologists. So, I mean, do you, how, how does that react with you internally to, to maybe have colleagues look down on you because of that or look down on the concepts? Yeah, so I'll just start by saying I haven't really gotten a lot of pushback. I've gotten remarkably little pushback uh, from my colleagues. Um, and I do think that one of the things that that is different about me from sort of the um, regular sort of conventional keto low-carb world is that I still, despite my very strong affinity and personal experience with it, uh, with, with, with keto and low-carb diets, I still believe that LDL is a... a problem uh, and that it is an important risk factor for developing cardiovascular, clinical cardiovascular disease. And I, I do think that allowing for that um, has left me in a different position with my colleagues um, where they might feel that some people who advocate for low-carb or keto diets do so while rejecting the lipid hypothesis or rejecting the LD, that, rejecting that LDL is an important causative risk factor in cardiovascular disease. So I, I do think that's probably part of the difference. And in fact, I think, you know, the, so the proof is in the pudding, right? I mean, I have developed pretty good relationships with a number of prominent plant-based or vegan cardiologists. And, and we have, obviously we have different ways of eating, but we've found a lot of common ground in the way we think about things. And I think the important overlap in, in sort of how we think about things is, is that we, you know, trust each other on some of the basic facts. And so, um, now, there are some of them out there who believe vehemently that any fat, even olive oil, even a few you know, drops of it are toxic and poisonous. Um, right. I'm probably never going to see eye to eye with those people, just as I think you know, maybe you know, somebody who believes that vegetables are poisonous are probably never going to see eye to eye with them. But I think we have found, I think there is enough evidence in in this mess of nutritional evidence that we all look at there's enough evidence i think that they can see that it uh, really comes down to from their perspective that that they can see that unsaturated fats and plant-based fats so you know oils and plant oils and fat that come from plant-based sources mostly seem to them to be relatively benign and i don't know about you know why or how this all happens but it does seem like we actually agree more than we disagree yeah, that's interesting. And so you talked about not getting much pushback from colleagues. How about from your dad? Has he given you some pushback? None at all. Uh, no, yeah. he, um, he, cert he and I would eat very differently, but he's also almost 80 years old and chooses to eat how he wants and I won't begrudge him that. But no, he yeah. doesn't. Uh, I think he's very deferential to me, just like I would, you know, he was an echo guy during his heyday. And so, you know, I would never argue with him about, about you know, a read on an echocardiogram. And likewise, I think, you know, he's not going to argue with me about nutrition science. I think he, he defers to me on that one. <laughs> Makes sense. And now tell us what are some of the, you mentioned briefly about your sort of personal journey with, with low carb. What, mm. what changed for you when you made it personal for yourself? What did you notice? Well, right. So, I mean, I never really saw myself as um, anything other than the way I saw myself when I was 18. You know, I think it's interesting, right? You get up in the morning every day, and look in the mirror and you look relatively the same to yourself because the changes are happening relatively slowly. Anyone who hasn't seen you for a while might feel differently. But, um, you know, as I got into my mid and late 40s, I definitely put on more weight, especially in the midsection. And, you know, I started to find that when I get blood work done, I would have an, you know, increased fasting glucose or my A1C was creeping up. And, Again, I found ways to kind of rationalize all that and ignore it. And I was busy and distracted and, you know, raised, you know, trying to parent two girls and, you know, keep a job and be a good husband, and all the stuff that I'm supposed to do. So I, I was able to kind of dismiss all that. Uh, when I started eating low carb, it was really somewhat of an accident. And, but the results were so profound and so, cool, so fast that it was impossible to ignore. I mean, you know, I lost. I'm six feet tall, and I probably at the time that I started weighed about 180 pounds. And I lost, uh, well, I lost 15 pounds within five weeks. And again, I wasn't even really trying to do it. And I distinctly remember it was sort of the end of the ski season, 
And I just remember not only was I, you know, feeling better, having more energy, but I was performing better. I mean, I was having, you know, I was able to stay out, you know, with my kids until late in the afternoon and, you know, not fall apart physically. And so I think it was really a physical transformation. I mean, people um, couldn't help but notice, like it was people would come up to me and occasionally I'd have people say things to me or to my wife, like, you know, just even of cancer because I lost so much weight so quickly. Um, oh, yeah. And so, yeah, it was a pretty rapid transformation. Um, and then, of course, you know, I had got blood work done and saw improvements across the board. And so I think for me, it was kind of a, a no brainer. And I basically, you know, won't ever go back. And I think, you know, a lot of things have changed in sort of the way I perceive food and think about food and rewards I get from it and how I taste it and things like that. I've now gone from probably preparing myself or, you know, having somebody in our family prepare maybe 25 to 30% of our meals a week to, to now it being closer to 80 to 90%. So it wasn't just the sort of replacement of carbohydrate, especially refined carbohydrates with, with fat. It was, it was changing, you know, the amount of processed food I was eating, preparing more food, spending more time in a farmer's, you know, doing all the things that sort of are generally going to make you healthier. So it really changed your whole relationship with food, which is, which is so important. It yeah. Did. And now, so where does it rank in terms of your interventions with your patients? Is it, is it a, you know, a go-to? Is it sort of something you look to put your patients on? Is it a fallback when other things don't work? Like how does low carb fit into your practice scheme? And I know, I know every patient's different, so it's hard to summarize. I'm sort of it, putting you on the spot. But. It, no, it's an interesting question. And I, and I, I'm it, um, so, uh, I don't know if afraid is the right word, but I'm, a, I'm really acutely aware of the potential conflicts of interest that I have. And so, you know, I have this company, and so I, I really want patients not to feel like I'm peddling, you know, m- my latest, you know, gimmick or trying to sell them something. And so um, I have mostly, now I have a lot of patients coming to see me because of my stance and my, you know, sort of experience with low carb. I would say the vast majority of new patients that I see these days are coming for that reason. Historically, the patients I had before, if they bring it up with me and, inter- and didn't want to introduce it, then I'm, I'm more than happy to have the conversation with them. Um, I have not been pushing it. Uh, and I think that's mostly just sort of this, you know, sort of con- fear of conflict that I have that I don't want to, uh, I don't want them to feel like I'm trying to profit off of them. Yeah, that, that's an interesting position. I mean, if you felt like it's something that could benefit them, but you're holding back because of this fear of conflict of interest. That that's that's yeah. sort of an interesting wrestle, wrestling match within yourself. I guess it is, and it's a hard one. I think what I've grown to, and maybe particularly over the past year, is I've grown to um, being able to make general recommendations to educate people around sort of the relative merits and demerits of so sort of each so sort of our foods and each macronutrient class without making a specific prescription or specific recommendations, specific or definitely a, not a product recommendation. So I, I would never, uh, on the rare occasions where I've actually suggested that somebody use a product that we sell, I've given it to them. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't charge, I wouldn't feel comfortable. I think it would be wrong for me to, uh, personally, at, given where I am and sort of what I do, it, it would be hard for me to sell my patients a product. Now, many of them have bought it before they come to see me and that's, that. you know, I can't do anything about that integrity over profits also something that's a little rare in the nutrition field nowadays it seems yeah it's good it's good to see though so but when it comes to i guess your version of low carb or your version of keto um i've heard you say that you propose or you personally and and sort of your beliefs are more around the lower saturated fat versions is that a, a tr- an accurate statement yes and i would say i think if you go back to the first question you asked me about sort of the evidence basis for nutrition science, I do think, and I mentioned to you that there were sort of a handful of well done or somewhat well done. Uh, there were, there are no perfect nutrition studies, but there are a handful of, um, of randomized controlled trials in nutrition science where the outcomes are hard. Uh, and I think the majority of those, if not all of them demonstrate benefits of, a Mediterranean diet. Uh, now you can argue about what do you what do you mean by Mediterranean? And it was <laughs> yeah. Predamed really Mediterranean? Was it really a trial of olive oil and nuts, or was 
it even really a trial? Was it retracted and republished? I mean, there are all these questions, but I do think there's something to the, um, I've always been intrigued by the Mediterranean diet. And so what I tell people, when people say like, how do you eat? I say, I do Mediterranean keto or effectively I do the Mediterranean diet, but I take out the pasta, the bread, the grains, and basically replace that with, you know, the healthier fats, I guess is the way I would put it. What I yeah. consider to be healthier fats. So yes, in net net, I do um, aspire to, and I've had conversations with people all the time about this, including most recently with Ron Krauss, who I think you know, has made a lot of uh, news in the past couple of months with his stance on saturated fat. And I think you know my uh, goal is not to get people to eat no saturated fat. I certainly don't think that's necessary or required. I aspire to eat less than more. Um, and so, uh, you know, and I hate sort of this concept of like putting numbers on things because I, I don't think even even I can deal with numbers. Like I, I'm not very good at tracking anything. And so I think to expect our patients to, you know, sort of understand what, what does 10% saturated fat mean? You right. know, what do all these different numbers mean? So I, for me, it's all about trying to put together sort of an average menu of sort of what do I typically eat? Um, and, and so that's how I kind of communicate with my patients. Man, I, you know, I think the saturated fat question is so interesting. And recently there was a Cochrane review that came out um, looking at the RCTs, looking at the randomized control trials with hard outcomes um, for saturated fats. And, and what they found was there was a very slight decrease in the incidence of cardiovascular disease uh, for eating less saturated fats with no difference in, in who lived or died or who had cardiovascular mortality. But then when you controlled for whether there was a change in cholesterol in response to saturated fat, then the benefits sort of went away. So it seemed like, at least by that study, it was a direct saturated fat affecting your cholesterol. And even then, it's sort of in that population, eating a high carbohydrate diet and a high carbo and a high saturated fat diet. And what are the versions of saturated fats? Because let's face it, we eat food, we don't eat saturated fat. So was it, you know, was it six ounces of steak or eight ounces of steak, or was it uh, a Philly cheesesteak sandwich with the big bread? You know, there are different, or pasta with um, meat sauce. So there are different versions of saturated fat. So it seems like the even the best data we have, it sort of weakens as you peel back the layers of the onion. Now, do you think that's sort of a fair way to look at it? Or do you, is that overly complicating it? Like, how do you, how do you respond? I, I do think that's mostly fair. I think, uh, you know, this is where the conversation often turns uh, in a direction where it sort of becomes just a bunch of people yelling at each other. But I, I think if you could approach it in a way where, let me put it this way. If I had a patient who came to me who was eating, you know, a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, and they were eating 40% of their daily calories from saturated fat, and their LDL cholesterol through whatever reason genetics or whatever it is or or if they happen to be taking drugs and their LDL cholesterol was in a range where I would you know be comfortable I'm I'm I, I'm fine with that I don't have any problem with it I think the point you've raised about the effect of saturated fat on LDL cholesterol or non HDL or ApoB is one that's been described for for ages and that relationship is real and I think that that is to me where this becomes you know the issue that is that if you're one of these people who does have a robust response in increasing you know, LDL cholesterol in, in, in proportion to how much saturated fat you eat, then I think that can be troublesome. In fact, um, you know, I saw a patient just this week who, you know, who had an LDL of 375. And now he came to see me. I didn't go out to see him. This was not an interaction on Twitter. This was not me, you know, trying to sort of have a conversation around this. This is somebody who came to me. And so I always start these conversations with, well, you came to see me for a reason. What was the reason? And he said, I'm worried about this. And yeah. so that that's, uh, I think that's probably fair. Now, if you were going to make sort of a, um, there is no sort of one right diet for everybody. But again, if I'm just telling people sort of the diet that I aspire to eat and just for me personally, what works best, it's sort of more, um, you know, fish. It's not that I don't eat any meat. I do. I eat meat, you know, a handful of times a month, but more fish and, uh, and less meat. Well, and, and it's helpful to hear, though, like with your patients, 
is not the meat per se, as long as the LDL is in a, an area where you're comfortable. That's right. And I, I want to get. I think that's fair. I think the, okay. the evidence supporting the independent harm of saturated fat in the absence of effects on LDL is probably really thin. And so I, I don't think it makes sense to, you know, to sort of hone in on that point uh, too okay. much. Yeah. And I want to get into more LDL, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm sort of purposely letting it slide and, and, and drag sure. it along to the end here. We'll finish with the big bang with LDL at the end and a couple more things in between. So before we dig a little deeper into the LDL, and, and actually this might be related, um, you and Nicola Guess wrote a, um, a, an article about low-carb tribalism back in May. And um, it, was, it was a very interesting article. Uh, and basically on the one hand, sort of talking about the benefits of keto and talking about the benefits of low carb, but talking about the dangers of how we can get carried away and how we talk about it. And, and specifically, you sort of compared it to guns and climate change and abortion and, and religion. And, um, and I'm, I'm curious sort of what motivated you to write that one and what was some of the sort of response you got after writing it? Yeah, so just to be clear, that article, even though it got... Um uh, portrayed as being focused on the low carbohydrate world, that was meant to be about new, tribalism and nutrition in general. And in fact, uh, although maybe we didn't flesh out as much of it, we certainly made the same claims about the plant-based or vegan world um, that there were as extreme, my experience is definitely true that there are as many extreme opinions in that world as there are, if not maybe more, in the low carb world. I think what we were trying to do is to try and take emotion and religion out of science. I think um, that was one of the things that felt frustrating to us was that it, fe it felt like we were um, relying not as much on data or science, but more on uh, opinions. And it became very much of a team sport uh, that there were, you know, people who were self-identified, you know, vegans who put a little plant in their you know, Twitter handle, and there were people who were, you know, carnivores who put a little C in their Twitter handle, and it was becoming this sort of team sport. So I think the, the general purpose of that article was to try to get people to focus on on the science and less on the sort of uh, competition or sport of it all. Yeah, I think that's a good way to say it as a team sport. That's an interesting I hadn't quite thought of it from that perspective, but I mean, that's part of human nature. People like to be part of a team. People like to belong. People like to feel included and you find your, your team. That's sort of what you teach sort of teenagers. You find your crew and you know, where you feel comfortable and where you feel like, you know, important and validated. And that, that's part of human nature. But I guess what you're saying is that is no part, part in science. Science should not have any role there. Right. And I think it's actually even one step beyond that. I think that we, uh, you know, sort of, Look, we talked at the beginning about what I was taught as a kid in my, you know, with my dad as a cardiologist and what we were all taught as young cardiologists and how a lot of the information we were given was wrong. And the reaction to that can be, oh my God, science sucks. Science is terrible. Scientists are telling us they're trying to poison us and kill us. Or it can be, hey, you know what? Science is about actually data and data evolve and evidence changes. And, you know, whereas, you know, in, in the 1970s and 80s, we focused on the potential dangers of, of fat and, and probably didn't recognize the dangers of carbohydrate. The evidence has changed now, and I think people are, you know, sort of seeing things differently. I don't think, I think one of the things that bothers me or bothered us and motivated us to write this was that one of the reactions uh, to people discovering low carb is that they then also um, dismiss nutrition science, you know, uh, as being, you know, biased and and poisonous. And so I think, or not just nutrition science, but sometimes even all science. And I think that particularly kind of rears its head, you know, with this sort of this story about cholesterol, which we keep coming back to. So that was sort of one of the one of the things. Um, yeah, it sure is the elephant in the room that's not going away. So so we'll get there. We'll get there. But but the it's interesting that we, I'm glad to hear you say that it was about nutritional science. The tribalism um, article was about nutrition in nutritional beliefs in general, because it's right. It's just as strong in, in vegan, if not stronger. And it's interesting. So if, if the nutritional epidemiological studies fit your narrative, 
then you sort of double down on how important they are. And if they don't fit your narrative, you sort of double down on on how poor they are. And I guess that's where I am. I mean, I, I actually truly believe they're very poor studies and the quality of the study doesn't back the strength of the recommendation by the ACC, by the AHA, by the dietary guidelines. Like the, the nutritional epidemiological study shouldn't inform a decision of how the world should eat. But if it fits your narrative, you sort of believe that. So it's interesting how you can sort of twist the same science to sort of fit your narrative. And I guess that maybe plays into this tribalism as well. Well, yeah. In fact, the tweet that I've pinned to my profile on Twitter is almost word for word what you just said. It's it's a quote that I took from Michael Lewis, who wrote The Undoing Project, which was about you know Amos Tversky and, uh, and Danny Kahneman. And I can't remember which one of them said it, but but the quote was, this is what happens when people become attached to a theory. They fit the evidence to the theory rather than the theory to the evidence. And I think that's sort of what's uh, happened in in nutrition science. And again, I'm not saying it's only or unique to uh, to low carb nutrition at all. It's not. It's it's everywhere. And I just, you know, Nicola and I think both agreed that that was there was no place for that. Uh, that we should be. Um, we don't need to dismiss and disparage all of science uh, because there were some things that changed over the decades. Right. I think that's a, that's a good summary and a, and a good sort of simplistic way to look at it. Say, look, it doesn't have to be more complicated than this other than science changes and we need to be able to change with it. That right. I mean, sense. the same conversations are happening these days in real time in warp speed with COVID, right? I mean, everyone loves to point to the fact that Tony Fauci went on 60 minutes in March saying that no one needs to wear a mask and, you know, I'm sure he really regrets saying that, but does that mean that Tony Fauci is a terrible scientist or that he, everything he says should be dismissed, you know, out of hand? Of course not. I mean, we all make mistakes. We all learn from our mistakes. And I think the mark of a great scientist is to be able to say, I made a mistake. I now can look at the data and see how I saw it wrong and we need to move on, which is, I think, you know, back to sort of the way I evolved into the world of low carb myself is to, you know, be able to say, actually, this is, this is different from the way I used to see it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's important. But again, going back to sort of rare features in a lot of physicians who've practiced a certain way for 20 or 30 years, or who've made their career on a certain, um, a certain way of research or, you know, certain guidelines, it's hard to say, you know what, I now recognize the science is changing and maybe what I've done for the past few decades was wrong. I mean, that can be very challenging for people to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So anyway, that was the spirit. Yes. And we did get a lot of pushback. And I think people focus. And in retrospect, we, we should probably not have made these sort of inflammatory, you know, statements about guns and politics and stuff. It was really, um, you know, probably an attempt to get people to pay attention. And of course, all they ended up doing was paying attention to that and they missed the <laughs> greater message. So it's a lesson on how not to write. Uh, I think, you know, were we to do it over again, we'd do it differently. But yeah. it's interesting, you know, we're both now involved in this, uh, you know, movement to try to find common ground in nutrition science that has people from all, spe- you know, all versions, all areas of the spectrum of sort of beliefs. Yeah, so, so sort of getting back to your quote then about the matching the theory, the, the evidence to the theory, um, you know, some people in the, in the plant-based community are now saying HDL doesn't matter because frequently the diets that they recommend can lower or certainly don't raise HDL. And there are drug trials showing that raising HDL doesn't help. So it fits their narrative to say HDL doesn't matter. People in the low carb world will say, well, HDL does matter if it can happen naturally. All right. So that's sort of, if you can raise it naturally, not with drugs. And so that's sort of fitting the narrative. And then of course, the same thing happens with LDL. And that's sort of the the elephant in the room here that that I knew we were going to get to eventually. So the question of does LDL matter for heart disease is different than the question of is LDL causal for heart disease, is different from the question of could there be areas where elevated LDL is not concerning? And those are three completely different questions that when you have a patient in front of you can be kind of hard to answer, can it? Sure. And HDL is even more complicated, or maybe less complicated. I don't know. Um, HDL is hard to talk about as well. They're both hard. Yeah. But HDL doesn't get the attention because HDL doesn't have the drugs and the and the guidelines and the it doesn't have the same um, sort of immediacy to it that LDL seems to have. 
Um, so do you think we should be focusing on HDL as much as we no. are in LDL? No. Okay. <laughs> well, and uh, and I think, again, you know, following the evidence, right, when we were coming up, I'm probably older than you are, but when I was being trained as a medical student, resident, fellow, uh, we were taught that, you know, LDL was was bad cholesterol, you know, that it was that you wanted it to be as low as possible, that HDL was good cholesterol, that you wanted it to, to be as high as possible through whatever mechanism. At that time, there were no drugs available other than niacin, but there was exercise and alcohol. And so there was sort of this idea that if you exercise more or drink a little bit of alcohol, it might raise your HDL, and that was thought to be a good thing. And we were told to ignore triglycerides largely unless they were <laughs> really elevated. Now, mostly through the work of human geneticists, like my friend, Sake Katharisen, who uh, you know now has moved on to, to a company, but Sake sh showed through really elegant Mendelian randomization studies that that was likely wrong. And this was before the drug trials, right? So this was before either drug trials showing that it show on HDL or triglycerides existed, right? We had tons of drug trials on LDL. That, that's the same. So what Sakes showed was that, yes, LDL looks to be causative. That is the genetic, the multiple genes controlling LDL levels seem are very strongly associated with risk of, of cardiovascular disease. That, that nothing changed there. But what he showed in advance of all of the HDL drug trials was that it looked like HDL wasn't playing a role in the causal pathway. That it didn't look like genetic regulation of HDL levels had any effect on outcomes. And then in fact, it was the opposite that triglycerides seemed to, the thing we were told to ignore, ignore for all these years. And so now we have drug trials showing that HDL, you know, multiple different classes of drug trials showing that raising HDL doesn't do anything to impact risk. Um, and we have sort of a drug trial showing maybe that drugs that impact the cholesterol, the triglyceride pathway may decrease risk, although that one's complicated. But I, but I think, uh, you know, again, from when I look at the evidence, I try to assimilate evidence in all four phases, right? So for me, those phases include sort of preclinical models, basic science, right? What do we know from animal models, whatever animal model you like, through, through epidemiology, through uh, human genetics, both single gene defects, as well as multigenic or polygenic diseases, and then drug interventional drug trials. And Again, the value of interventional drug trials, and you know, we get into this all the time, but the value for interventional drug trials, especially in prospective randomized trials, is that that is the scenario in which it's easiest to control the baseline population and make sure that they're matched. In all these other trials, it's much harder to do and introduces all sorts of potential bias. So that's sort of the way I look at things you know, in this with four the four different sort of uh, kinds of evidence. And, and that's how I form my opinions today that I'm reserved the right to change tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what makes HDL so interesting is that it, the whole concern of HDL started because of the observational studies that showed if you had low HDL, you were at higher risk for heart disease. So the logical conclusion is you don't want to have low HDL. Well, how can you not have low HDL is different than saying you want to have high HDL, that you want to do things to purposely raise your HDL versus not have a low HDL. And it may sound like the same thing, but so, because low HDL is associated with metabolic dysfunction and di type 2 diabetes and, and insulin resistance and other things that show, that per confer other risks. So if you can use HDL as a marker more than a causative effect, then having a lifestyle to raise HDL could still be beneficial because you're no longer in that pool where you would be identified as a higher risk. Maybe. Does that sort of make sense? I, Maybe. I think it's probably much more that HDL, low HDL is a marker of high triglycerides, that those two are linked together and that mm -hmm. the risk we're attributing to HDL is probably risk that should be attributed to triglyceride. To that's triglyceride interesting, and, okay. Uh, um, that's my bias. I think HDL is an independent... Uh, it certainly is a marker, but it's probably a marker of insulin resistance and high triglycerides. So again, right. if you control for insulin resistance and high triglycerides, then the effect of HDL goes away. Which is fortunate because there happens to be a dietary intervention right. that's very good at lowering triglycerides yeah. and raising yes. HDL, right. doing both with, right, which is the low carb dietary intervention. Now, in that dietary intervention, the majority of the patients who are studied in the research trials do not have elevation in their LDL. So I think the the concern by most cardiologists um, when they hear keto or low carb is, oh, your LDL is going to go up 
no, stay away from it because this is going to happen. But it actually likely happens in a, in a minority of the patients, certainly based on the data we have, but it can happen. So when it does happen, and when it happens with normal HDL, with low triglycerides, when it happens with an improvement in metabolic health or you know reversal of metabolic syndrome and low inflammatory markers, all the things that um, oh, I wish I had the, it to put up, but that that diagram in the European Society of Cardiology, their their article of how LDL is causal for heart disease had like twenty different points coming in. You know, hypertension and inflammation and glycated end products, and you know, which I think is a little humorous if you're saying it's causal, but is still dependent on all these other interactions. So, can if you can control the majority of those other factors, and LDL is the one, the one elevated. Um, abnormality, is there a, a spot in your brain that says, okay, this could be different than all the evidence we have to date and maybe does deserve a special lens to look at rather than looking at it as all this, everybody, all the other populations combined? Yes. And it's a fantastic okay. question and it needs to be answered, but here's the but. It's not yeah. answered right now. So then what do we right. do in the meantime? And in the meantime, we have a choice, right? We have to wait until the experiments are done, whenever they're done which is gonna be a while. So what do we tell our patients in the meantime? And right. for me personally, when I put together the whole picture of evidence, I have a hard time telling people that they should ignore HDL, or sorry, LDL. I think uh, the, the question of do the net effects of low carbohydrate diets, including weight loss, improved metabolic health, insulin sensitivity, you know, HDL for whatever it's worth, lower triglycerides, all the different things that we see, lowered inflammation, is that net, you know, improved fatty liver, all these other things that we know are risk contribute, you know, risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Net net, does that actually net out whatever negative, potential negative effects of LDL? That is a spectacular question. And I guess from my perspective, if you can get all of that stuff that we just talked about that's yummy and good and great and that we all want without the rise in LDL, would you choose that for now, just given that we have uncertainty? And so that's how I ended up in this sort of Mediterranean version, substituting a lot more unsaturated fats, because I found personally, and I think, you know, while the studies haven't been done, I think there's pretty strong suggestion that if you can replace, in not everybody, but in some people, if you can replace a lot of that saturated fat with unsaturated fat, that you'll move the LDL back down. So then you get all the benefits, plus you get you don't have to worry about the LDL. That's sort of the way I look at it. Yeah. 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 And I think that's interesting. And that's, that's where there is sort of this disconnect between looking at the question, looking at the evidence we have, pointing out the holes in the evidence and then saying, okay, look, there are all these holes, but then here I am sitting across either the room or the computer from a patient. And what do I do with this patient? And I don't know that it's, it's an automatic, you know, you have to lower your LDL or and it's not an automatic you can ignore your LDL, right? It's, it's, it's somewhere in between. And like you said, with the patient who came to you, you said, why are you here? And he said, because I'm worried about this. You have to get to, you know, the, the beliefs of your patient sort of plays into it as well, as much as the beliefs of, of yourself. Um, so it was actually good to hear you say that because I think so many doctors would do sort of like a knee jerk. This has to be taken care of. Um, as opposed to, well, let's explore other options potentially and, and talk about the, the risks and the benefits. And that's, that's harder. That's harder than writing a prescription, isn't it? It is. And that is uh, why when I see a patient who comes to me with this question, which happens a lot these days, I have a prepared speech. And my speech goes like this. I say, there are four things we can do with this news that your LDL is up in response to you going on a low-carb hydrate diet. Right? I mean, most of it is people say, my, L, my LDL was sort of fine, and then I went on a low-carb diet, and it went, it skyrocketed. So I said, there are four things you can do. And I start off by saying, no matter what you choose, I'm going to support you, and I will see you in my practice. I'm not going to kick you out of my practice and reject you and tell you that I can't you know, see you anymore if you choose to do something that may not be exactly what I would choose. But I said, by the same token, I'm going to give you what I would do uh, without making it sound overly judgmental. But here are the four things you can do. Number one, you can ignore it. You can say there's this sort of potential netting out and we don't have any evidence that it is harmful. And so until there's evidence that it is harmful, I'm gonna wait around for that, even though they're maybe too late at that point. So that's one option. Option two is to take, um, is to say, all right, well, maybe you don't 
do low carbohydrate anymore. Maybe you decide you're going to go back to eating a, you know, more carbohydrates, which I think, you know, some people in the low carb community have even discussed as a potential way to mitigate this is to not go completely back the other direction, but to add in some more carbohydrates in the form of berries and, and other things. Option three would be to do what I typically do, which is to kind of try and moderate your saturated fat intake and replace that with unsaturated fats, mostly monos and and three omega three poly, you know, polys, so fish, fish oils. And the fourth option is to take a drug. And and again, the drug sort of the, gets the most attention in this conversation is always our drug class is always statins. But there are other choices. And uh, for people who are uncomfortable with or can't tolerate statins, and that's what they choose to want to do, I present them with those options as well. So that's sort of the way I approach this clinically with patients. I will make one other editorial comment, and I run the risk of offending people. But I can say this to you, because I do think that it is a different world that we live in, you and I live in, when you sit in front of a patient or across a computer screen from a patient and have to make you know, clinical decisions, then it is the world when you can pontificate uh, broadly but in, and widely, but don't actually have to interact with patients. I do, I do think it's a very different experience. And it's not, as many people want to say, it is not driven, at least in my case, by fear of a legal response. I could not give two, I don't want to get your podcast rated, but I could not give two, you know what, <laughs> about, um, I, I don't, I've never been sued, knock on wood, hopefully I never will be sued. But I think as long as I, you know, continue to do what I've been trying to do, which is to convey to people, you know, recommendations that are based in its solid evidence, I, I don't think I'm going to get sued. Um, I think for me, it's about wanting to do what, you know, what's right for my patients and what's best yeah. for them. That's incredibly well said, and and I agree one hundred percent with with everything you just said. And I think it's good that there are people digging in the literature and pointing out inconsistencies and bringing things to attention that that previously haven't been talked about. I think that's so important. But you're right; that's very different than sitting apart across from a patient and needing to make a decision of what's right for this person in this moment with what we know and what we don't know. Yeah, I, I think you know. Let me ask you this: I have a little sort of anecdotal, not very well controlled experiment going where among people that I interact with in the low carb community, I try to sort of stratify by clinicians, people who are taking care of patients and, and non-clinicians, just to forget whatever else they might do. And I do think that there, there seems to be a, a different approach to managing cholesterol among the clinicians. Do you, do you share that? A, a difference among the clinician, the low carb clinicians versus yeah. the non-clinicians. Yeah. 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 I think that's true. And I think yeah. it's exactly because of what we're talking about. Um, because it's not black and white, um, and because you need to discuss things with the patient and and see what their fears are, and see what their their hopes are, and and what their desires are, and and that plays a lot into it. Um, and yeah, I mean, the other thing is though, what else is going on, right? Because at least in my practice, I find that I get a number of people come to me and say I'm a hyper responder, so. My LDL is the only problem, right? But then they have a high LP little a, or their inflammatory markers are still high, and they have a you know a chronic autoimmune condition or something, you know something else that that muddies the picture. So maybe the uh, we see a lot of epi, um, experiences that aren't so cut and dried either. Um, and I think that's important to to not to not just boil it down to the the one thing and that's it, um, but really look at the whole picture and all the other risk factors because. Look, you look at the ASCVD calculator, there's no LP little a in there. There's no CRP in there. You know, there's a lot of things that aren't um, incorporated into that calculator that we should be incorporating into cardiovascular risk. And this is, the situation is no different than that. True. Yeah. Although I guess in theory, you capture LP little a in the non-HDL fraction, but, but yes, you're right. And there's no inflammation there. There's no family history, uh, which is always right. interesting. Right. That's interesting as well. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I think that was that's that's a good perspective. Um, and and some people in the low carb community obviously give you a very hard time for having that perspective. But I, I think it, it's perfectly reasonable and so much so much better than the perspectives of people who won't even listen to it and won't even open their eyes to the potential that there's something different about this situation. Um, I guess what I don't understand is why you, in order to sort of believe in the benefits of low carbohydrate nutrition, you're also forced to dismiss the role of LDL in the pathogenesis of cardiovascular of coronary disease. I, I, that's what I've never understood is why do those two things get linked together? I think I understand psychologically or sociologically how that happened, but I don't understand when you're just sitting here, uh, you know, having a conversation, why the two have to be linked together. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I think I think part of it is that narrative that we were talking about, right? You want you want to fit your narrative, but also to be low carb, you sort of have to question the the norm. You have to question the the, the authority of what we've been taught for the past thirty years. So if you question it in one area, you likely question it in other areas too. So I think it's the personality of of the people who are drawn to this way of living that um, makes you makes you a little controversial or contrarian, I guess I should say. But as you said, we sort of don't know, um, and it's a great question that needs to be studied. Now, you're a researcher. You know the ins and outs of health research, nutrition research. Can this really be studied? Can we prove this to the point or investigate it well enough to appease people on both sides that it has been studied? What, what do you think the chances are? Yeah, of course. It can be done. It will require a lot of resources. I mean, we're looking at doing some trials not in coronary disease, but in other areas in cardiology that keto is going to sponsor that I think are really exciting and potentially you know, practice changing. So I think it can be done. Uh, that is an area of medicine that is notoriously difficult to study in clinical trials because of the you know, rareness of the events, the length of the trials, and the power that you need to be able to detect the meaningful difference. So we know from, from drug trials that you know, these are thousands of patient trials, which I think it's going to take enormous, you know, uh, mobilization of resources to be able to do, but I certainly think it can be done. I think the threat is, as you described, that the, you know, there could be a bad outcome. That to me is sort of more theoretical and would potentially obviously be, um, you know, devastating, but, but it's you know, probably a long ways away before we have something real that we can hang our hat on. When I'm talking about threat, I'm talking about sort of going back to the I guess the very last talk I gave at a meeting before COVID was in February. I went to DC and gave a talk at CRT, which is Interventional Cardiology Conference. And it was organized by Kim Williams, who's a very prominent vegan cardiologist. He's also very prominent on the, uh, in the American Card College of Cardiology. And, you know, he's an old timer and he and I had gotten into some things on Twitter before because he's usually involved in writing guidelines and he's been very unfriendly to keto. But he invited mm -hmm. me to come give a talk on low carbohydrate nutrition at CRT, a session that he organized and moderated. I was the That's only, impressive. not only was I the only low carb doc there, I was the only non-vegan among the group. <laughs> there were like 10 vegans and me. And uh, I have no idea what the audience makeup was, but I imagine it was a little bit more balanced, but it went incredibly well. And I think what they saw was, it was somewhat demystifying and, um, and making keto less scary because to them keto is about, you know, eating slabs of bacon and, you know, whole cows and everything else. And once they could see that there's a way to do keto that was maybe not exactly how they would eat, but in their sort of mind a little cleaner, I think it became much less threatening to them. And this is a group of people who have like lobbied Congress to try and, you know, block keto study. I mean, they, they, this is a group of people who's been, who've been historically very unfriendly to keto. So I think we were able to find a common ground, a middle ground, where they saw this as not only not threatening, but also potentially something useful. And again, what I did was focus on the data and, and focus on shared areas of belief. And one of those areas of shared belief was obviously over the role of, you know, sort of lipids and cardiovascular disease. So it did change. Right. Um, and again, I think you asked me early on about what my, what my colleagues think. I mean, my colleagues, I think, are very open to all of this because I think they know that I have not like, gone and lost my marbles. And so um, I think they trust that, uh, that this is something that I've thought a lot about. And, you know, again, making the most informed decision I can with the data that we have is sort of the way that we typically talk right. about it. So, so first of all, that was incredibly brave of you to step into the lion's den like that. You and a panel of of ten, of ten vegans that could be uh, that could be intimidating. So, kudos to you for 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 taking it on and and stepping up. But secondly, that makes sense. So, when you talk about the the danger or or the the danger of of um, LDL, it's more of the if if mainstream doctors or contemporary doctors see keto as necessarily giving up on LDL or ignoring LDL, then they'll never even consider right. it. Yeah. So you have to, you have to separate those two for it to become more adopted. That's and right. That and makes, and that if you do that and, uh, and you make it less scary, then, then it becomes an option, right? It becomes a viable option. It's not something that these folks would generally do for ethical reasons. Um, most of them, 
but but they didn't see it as as like you know heresy and evil as I think they might have before. And I've become you know pretty good friends with a bunch of them. And I think you know again it comes back to the same idea that we share more in common than not. And you know really what I tell them is I'm a vegan, but I eat I eat fish um, and occasionally have some 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 animal meat, but. The basically, you know, it's the, we, we actually, our diets aren't that different. Well, you know, the old story that, you know, eating meat is basically being vegan because the cows turn the grass right. into protein. So you're eating the, right. the protein, the proteinified grass. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I, I know we, we've covered a lot. We're coming up on the hour. We didn't even get to um, your COVID experience, how you, you flew from San Francisco to New York um, specifically to serve on a COVID ward. Um, as a volunteer to, to help out. I mean, that must, and you've written about it. I encourage people to read about that and, and your experience with your daughter as well when you, you had a very well-written piece of should broken genes be fixed about that with, um, and I, know, I, I guess I'm lamenting here that we didn't get to cover these, but do you want to make any some comments uh, about either of those top, two topics? Pick one to sort of summarize your experience and, and, and what you think people can learn from your experiences. Uh, I mean, sure. I think the, the story with my daughter is a great story. I think, it, and it has, um, I think it has implications for all of us. Maybe it's changed the way I think about things as a scientist in addition to how I think about things as a parent. But, um, I think the main, the main issue with, with Ruthie, with my, you know, so my younger daughter who's going to be 14, you know, in a week or so, uh, has ocular cutaneous albinism. So she's the sort of colloquial term for that is that she's an albino, although it's people prefer not to use that. Uh, terminology. So she she says that she's a person with albinism, um, and so the, you know, as you know, she the main issue with that is that she her vision is very impaired. She's legally blind. Uh, for people who understand what that means, it's her her visual acuity is twenty over two hundred. But she's a kid um, who you know, sort of makes the most of what she has, and you know, kind of doesn't know the word no, and um, is very active and plays basketball and skis and does all this other stuff. Um, the thing that was sort of a revelation for us was this was a kid that we didn't want to have, right? This was a kid that if we had been given the opportunity to not have her or to have her without this mutation that she carries around, we would have chosen that. And I think the sort of learning that I had was uh, that that would have deprived the world of something important and yeah. that her impact on us you know, here in our family, but on her community, on the her peers, uh, and hopefully, you know, someday on the world has been dramatic and positive. And, you know, more importantly, you know, obviously no parent wants their child to suffer. But when you ask Ruthie, you know, sort of, if you could go back in time, unwind everything and edit out this gene and fix it and not have albinism, would you do that? She's very consistently since the age of nine, when I first asked her that question, she said no. And continues to say that today. Now, she may change her mind. And I have said again and again, I'll say it till I die, that if she comes to me someday and says, Dad, I don't want this. I want to be able to see normally. Can we explore an option to use CRISPR or some other te gene editing technology to try and fix this? I'll say, of course. So I'm not fundamentally opposed to her, uh, you know, someday deciding that she wants to be able to, you know, overcome this diversity in another way. But as of now, at least in her 14 years on this planet, she's, she's I think, more um, thrived, um, you know, be, almost because of her, her difference and because of her disability than she has in spite of it. So uh, she's, she's a pretty special kid. And obviously, she changes, she has a big impact on our family and changes the way I think about a lot of things. Yeah, a big impact on your family and a big impact on probably just about everybody she meets meets in everybody's life she touches so yeah know, and, and the, of course perspective. the question that we all ask again and again or i ask because i like to think about these kinds of philosophical things is is you know is would she have had that impact if she didn't have this difference like we've yeah. you know it's an experiment you can never do but uh you right. know in other words is this just her force of personality is she just this kind of person who you know would otherwise be this impactful or was it really is it really you know because of this you know, difference? So we'll never know the yeah. difference. We'll never know. But we like having her the way she is. It's been a really interesting experience for me, especially as a scientist and somebody who thinks a lot about genetics and gene editing and all these other things. It's been a kind of interesting ride um, to kind of come through this on the other side, sort of as a parent and a loved one, as opposed to the, a scientist or even a clinician.
right? So I, I found it on your Twitter feed. I don't know, is there some way you can direct people who want to read more about it? Because it's such a great human piece to read. Where can people go yeah, to, to actually, read that the, specific piece? The original article that I wrote was um, if for a medical journal that I think is called Perspectives in Biomedicine. So I'll send you the link. But the title of the article, actually, the title of the article is Billy Idol, which is the nickname that we gave to her when she was born because she had white hair. With the white hair. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and so I bet if you just Google my name and Billy Idol, you'll see the link to this article come up. Okay. And that's a longer version of the article that was published in, in Stat News. Um, and there have been a couple, you know, obviously, she, actually, she's, she's gotten quite a lot of press attention. She was in a documentary film and, um, and yeah, there's a, there's a lot there. She was recently quoted in the New York times, uh, in a, you know, story about Gina. And so. Great. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. All right. And well, and I mentioned your Twitter feed. I mean, I highly recommend anybody listening who is, is interested to follow your Twitter feed. It's a great feed. You get a little bit of sports, but not so much sports lately. You get a lot about medicine and nutrition and research, and then a lot of just about what's going on with the world and some really good perspectives. So I highly recommend Twitter. So what's your Twitter handle where people can Thank find you. you? That's very kind. Uh, but it's e Ethan J. Weiss. So it's my first name, middle initial, and last name. So at Ethan okay. J. Weiss. And then where else can you direct people to, to kind of learn more about you? Uh, I mean, I guess you can... I mean, that's probably the best place. Uh, my, I have... If you want to look at my academic... Um, you know, homepage, I think you could just Google me and say UCSF and that'll come up. And on there is all my contact information. People don't have a hard time finding me. My you know, phone number and email and everything is pretty easy to dig up. So if anyone wants to find me, uh, I'm not hard. My DMs are open on Twitter. I don't spend very much time on Instagram or other social media. It's hard enough to manage one. So it's kind of my all right. go to. Great. Well, Twitter it is. Well, I can happily say you confirmed my uh, my suspicions that uh, you're a wonderful person to talk to. I really enjoy your perspective on things. I really like how you how you see things in in a balanced way and 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 go back to the evidence and try and take the emotion out of it. And uh, it was great. So you you confirmed all my suspicions. So congratulations. That's dangerous, Brett. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you. All right. All right. Very good. Thanks for joining thank us. You. Have a good day.